Hi, I'm Charlene Collins Freeman. Welcome to my workshop on painting with granulating watercolors. First off, let's talk about what is granulation. Have you ever noticed how some watercolor paints dry differently than others? Some paints produce a smooth, even wash, but others seem to have a life of their own and can create some pretty amazing textured patterns. They're really quite beautiful, but if you don't know to expect them, they can also be off-putting. For example, if you're trying to paint the smooth skin of a baby, or you want to paint a smooth summer sky. But granulation can create beautiful effects for subjects like moss or rust, sand, textured wood. There are a lot of uses for granulation, and one of my favorite is using them for backgrounds. So watercolor paints are made up of pigments and a binder. Typically, the binder in watercolors is gum arabic. The pigments are made from all sorts of materials, some natural and some man-made. And it's the pigment that gives our paints their color. Pigments come in a variety of sizes and shapes, even when they're ground down. And it's the particle size and shape that makes granulation. Here are a few samples of granulating paint. As a general rule, small fine pigment particles produce less granulation, and these watercolors tend to produce flat, smooth, painted surfaces. For example, quinacridone paints and thalo paints are man-made, and their particles are small and even. When you paint with these paints, generally they lay down very smoothly. Here are some of my paintings that I created using granulating paints. The larger and heavier and more irregularly sized the particles are in a pigment, the more it will likely cause granulation. Many of the natural earth pigments fall into this category, the umbers, the siennas, and so forth. A lot of blues and cadmiums also fall into this category. There are so many colors, and I decided to figure out which from my large stash are granulators. I use predominantly Daniel Smith watercolors, and a few years ago I decided to make a swatch book of all their colors. I purchased their dot chart, which gives you just a dot of paint, and I used all of these to make my swatch book. Making this swatch book took a long time, but I refer back to it all the time. I use mostly cold press arches paper, either 140 pound or 300 pound. So that's what I used in my swatch book. It's important to test out your paints on the paper you plan on using for your paintings, because all paints lay down differently on different papers and granulators in particular behave very differently between cold press, hot press, and rough paper. Here I'm flipping through my swatch book, and one reason I love it is it gives me at a quick glance the color options that are available. You really can't tell the color of a paint by looking at the ribbon of color printed on the tubes. And you can't even really tell what a color will look like from looking at it in your palette. So painting these small swatches gives me a realistic idea of what each pigment looks like. But it also tells me a lot of the other properties of the paint, such as transparency and granulation. So I flip through my sketchbook looking for any granulators. Then I looked through my stash of paints and pulled any that showed up as granulators. Since I also use hot press for my botanical artwork, I did the same exercise on hot press paper. There was just enough left of each dot to do this exercise twice. Now you're looking at the examples on hot press paper 
and hopefully you can see how the paint lays down differently. On hot press, the granulation seems to do its own thing. It doesn't lay down as evenly as it does on cold and rough paper. It's much more unpredictable and tends to pool in areas or avoid other areas altogether. There's also a big difference in both the brand and quality of paints you use. Student grade paints have much less pure pigment. Some don't have any pigment. And these cheaper paints are filled up instead with dyes and various fillers. Therefore, they don't granulate. Professional grade, or sometimes referred to as artist grade paints, are entirely made up of pigment and binder. So these will granulate for you. There's also a huge difference in granulation from brand to brand. Even if the paint has the same name, for example, Ultramarine Blue, you might find that it granulates more in one brand than in another. At the end of this swatch book, you'll think I'm crazy, but I also scanned all of these and printed them out in black and white. I did this to get a realistic sense of the values of each pigment, since looking at colors can really throw our sense of value. So once I had studied my swatch book and pulled all the granulators I could see in it that I have, I decided to make a small sketchbook dedicated just to my granulating watercolors. I'm using a Pentelic Aqua Journal for this and it has a really lovely cold press paper. And here you can see the swatches I made of my granulating watercolors. Even though these are all Daniel Smith paints, what you'll find is that even within one brand of paints, there's a variety of how much granulation you'll get. For example, yellow ochre is a barely granulating color. And then some granulate more moderately, such as ultramarine blue. And some pigments granulate intensely, such as one of my favorites, green appetite genuine. So let me show you how I made these swatches. Using a regular piece of copier paper, I made a template. This just saved me having to measure out my template over and over again for each page. I wanted five narrow strips where I could paint different values of the granulators. And then on the top, there's a bigger swatch so I could see how the paint lays down in a bigger area. Granulators tend to granulate more with more water. So it was important to me to see how they were at different values. A lighter value requires more water. And the darker values get less water. So I wanted to highlight five different values and see how much each one granulated more or less. And then in the bigger rectangle on top, I just wanted to see if the granulator laid down more evenly across the whole swatch, as opposed to pooling up in arbitrary areas. Then I wrote down the names of the pigments. And with just a little bit of watercolor squoze out onto my palette, I started off with the most watery version. And you can see in my palette, it really is watery. It's sort of a weak tea. I add small increments of pigment to my mix. And I paint the next narrow strip. If I find that visually there's not much of a difference between one strip and the next, I add a little bit more pigment to my mix. And while that strip is still damp or wet, I go ahead and add that pigment into it. I do this for all five strips. Basically, by the time I get to the top strip, it's pretty thick paint. 
And with the swatches, I definitely recognize that the thicker the paint, the less granulation I could see. I recommend you do this exercise for all of your granulating paints. If you're not sure which of your paints are granulators and you don't want to spend a month making a swatch book, you can go to that manufacturer's website and look up their paints. For example, on the Daniel Smith website, whenever I pull up the name of a paint, it will tell me its transparency rating, its light fast rating, and if it's a granulator or not. For the purposes of getting to know granulating paints well, I would pull out all of the paints you have that are granulators and make swatches similar to this. Maybe you don't want to do five values, you could just do three values. And I would definitely paint a larger area just to see if you can get it laid down evenly. Some of the paints, for example, cobalt paints, although they are granulators, they don't paint evenly in a larger area. They go down pretty rough. And that's what this larger swatch will tell you. As I lay down the swatches, I'm paying attention to the fact that sometimes the paint will pull up, especially in the corners. And if you're doing this in a sketchbook like I am, instead of a flat piece of paper, it might pull up in whichever direction the paper is laying. As that paint pulls up, I clean out my brush, dry it off on a towel, and I just touch the end of the brush into those areas essentially using it as a sponge to just pick up that extra bit of water and paint so that I don't get a blossom as the swatch dries. This sketchbook is five by eight and I'm fitting four colors across the spread. I'll paint one more for you so you can see how I do it. And then I recommend you do the same for your colors. I'm using this small palette, so I decide to clean out the center, which is my mixing area. But if you're using a bigger palette, you don't have to keep cleaning out all the paint like I'm doing here. So again, I start by giving myself a small dollop of paint. And I begin the values with the most watery version. I find it easier to build up and go to darker and darker values when I start from the light, as opposed to starting on the dark side of the values and trying to add enough water to get to the lightest. It's really common not to add enough water and then realize that you have five swatches that go from dark to medium instead of from dark to medium to light. After I get that first swatch in, I just add progressively a little bit more pigment to my mix. This is slow work and I find it much easier to just do two or three colors at a time and then go do something else. You also want to leave a gap of paper between your value swatches. If they butt up against each other, it's very likely that they'll start bleeding into each other if you barely touch the brush from one swatch to the other unless that first swatch is completely dry. So I just found it easier to leave a little bit of 
white paper between the swatches and not have to worry about letting them dry before applying the next swatch. By the time I've worked up to this fourth swatch, you can see my paint is starting to get really thick. It increases in thickness from that weak tea consistency of the first swatch to maybe a skim milk consistency, then a milk, maybe a heavier creamy milk. And now it's getting pretty creamy and the last swatch, the fifth swatch, has a buttery consistency. And again, I notice that the granulation is much more obvious the more watery a paint mix is. As I paint the larger area, I'm trying to get as smooth of a patch as I can get. I load up my brush and I push my brush into the paint all the way up to the ferrule. It's fully loaded. I brush stroke in one direction and then I brush stroke in the opposite direction. This makes sure that the paint doesn't all pool in one area or the other. I'm trying to get an even distribution of paint in this rectangle. If your paint starts to pull up, especially in the corners, which is really common, just rinse out your brush, tap out that excess water on a towel, and then touch that thirsty brush into that pool of paint. The brush will act like a sponge and will soak up that excess water and paint. Enjoy making your swatches. It's really great fun getting to know our paints. For our first week of projects, I thought it would be fun to do some simple landscapes, starting with this road trip scene. I'm using a block of Arches rough paper. It's slightly shy of 6 by 12. I'm keeping the drawing super simple on this. I draw a horizontal line just not in the center of the page. It can be slightly higher than the center or slightly lower, but putting the horizon right in the middle of the page makes it a pretty static composition. I then draw the road, and the road is working towards a vanishing point. The only other element I draw in is the center line, which also goes to that vanishing point. I draw both sides of the white line down the center of the road. And then we're ready to start painting. I start with the sky. I want to do a wet into wet application. So I start by just painting water from the horizon line on up. I want some granulation in my sky and I'll use more than one color. By painting them wet into wet, the colors will softly diffuse together. Also because granulation shows up more the wetter a paint is, I like the idea of dropping it into water and having the granulation show up more. Wet into wet really requires quite a bit of water, so don't be stingy with your water. I'm painting it on quickly so that it is completely wet by the time I finish from one end to the other. I don't want the areas where I started to be dry by the time I finish applying the water. I run my brush over the areas where it's pooling up, and this commonly is also the edges. I want the water to be somewhat even. 
and I give it a second to soak into my paper. My paper will still be wet, but I've given it a minute so that the water is not just pooling on the surface. In the meantime, I get my paint started. I have just a touch of phthalo blue green shade, which is not a granulating color, and I add imperial purple to it, which is a granulating color. And I want these two colors to be the predominant colors in my sky, one granulating and one non-granulating. Whenever we mix a granulator into a non-granulator, they both become granulators. I leave plenty of white of the paper. I'm not painting every square inch of the sky. As the water and paint are pooling onto the edges, I just run a damp brush, which I keep soaking out on my towel along the edges, and that picks up all the excess water. While the sky is still wet, I pick up my paper and tilt it, letting the colors run together. I tilt it in the other direction. And yet again, in another direction, I can see the water pooling up. So with a dry brush, I just tap on it and get that water off of the edge. As I tilt my paper to let the colors run together, I give it some time. I don't just give it a two second tilt and then go in another direction. I really let it tilt for five or 10 seconds. I'm showing you this video in real time, which just means this is how long it took me to paint. While I wait for that sky to dry, I'm going to start on a second and a third painting. Here I am also using a block of Arches paper. This is 12 by 9 cold press paper. And I've placed a piece of artist tape right down the center. I will do both of my small landscapes on this one sheet of paper. My drawing for the lavender field starts off in a similar way as the road trip. There's a horizon line, and then I have several lines that are also going towards a vanishing point. Instead of the road, this time I'm just showing the rows of lavender. That's all the drawing I need to do for this painting. And just like the road trip, I start off with a wet into wet sky. Lots of water, evenly distributed. And painting only up to my horizon line. I'll paint the sky in a similar way as I did the road trip, but using different colors. After soaking up the excess water on the edges of the paper, I get my mixture ready. I'm using Rose of Ultramarine, which is one of my all-time favorite granulators. Imperial Purple, and just for the fun of it, I picked up some of the Thalo Blue Green Shade I mixed earlier for the road trip painting. I leave just a little bit of white on the paper for the sky, and I do my darker shades at the very top of the page. This might look fairly dark for a sky, but I know that this color will fade as it dries. Watercolor always fades as it dries, so painting a little bit stronger than your ultimate goal will usually work out pretty well.
I noticed a spot of dirty paint water on the top half of my paper. To get it out, I recommend flooding it with water and then tapping it out with a towel. Often our instinct is right away to go in there with a towel, but if we haven't flooded it with water, using that towel will generally push the pigment right into the paper instead of lifting it out. Now I need to wait for my lavender sky to dry. So I'm turning my page around and I'll start working on the third landscape. Since so much about watercolors is timing and letting things dry without nagging them, it's great to have more than one project going at a time. Instead of being tempted to keep nagging an area, you can set it aside and move on to the next project. For this third landscape, we have trees in an atmospheric, foggy scene. I'm not doing any drawing, I'm just going straight water to paint. I start off by wetting the entire area that I will use for my painting. And using Lunar Blue, I start painting in what will be both background and foggy area. I keep my brush strokes fairly organic. I don't want to start painting in straight lines like I'm painting a house or a picket fence. If any of my brush strokes end up showing up as the painting is drying, I don't want them to look too regular and too man-made. So this sort of organic brush stroke really helps it look more natural. Already this lunar blue is starting to granulate and it's great fun. I add some sap green and lunar blue together and start painting in the lower area. I'm just making up shapes of trees. Because the paper is still wet, everything is diffusing together and that helps create that idea of fog or mist in the mountains. I decide to let these two paintings dry and go back to the first one we started, which now is dry. I apologize for the glare in my studio. I think at some point the sun came out pretty bright and I didn't even notice that the light had changed. Bear with me. It'll calm down in just a little bit. With the sky dry, it's time to come in and paint the road. I'm using lunar black and it's at a pretty watery consistency. In fact, you can see on my little palette in the center where the lunar black is, just how watery the paint is that I'm using. I paint carefully down next to the white stripe in the center of the street. And I make it darker towards the bottom of the painting, closer to the viewer, and lighter as the road pulls away from the viewer. While it's still damp, I add in a touch of imperial purple. Now you can see the painting more clearly. I have a skylight right above me and wow does it make a difference. When that sun comes out it really washes everything out on my table. I would have never realized that if I wasn't videotaping. Back to the road, I'm using Lunar Black and Imperial Purple and getting the first layer in. I'm starting off pretty light. It's easy to build up layers. When we build up layers with granulating paints, they react differently from pigment to pigment. Some granulators like the layers and just get more and more textured. 
other granulators seem to wash out their particles and the granulation starts to soften or altogether disappears with every layer. So it's interesting to explore that as well. While the road is just slightly damp, I come in and add a few more dark brush strokes of lunar black. Every time this road dries, I feel like it needs another layer. I'm just not getting it dark enough. I also don't want to make it all the same level of value and color from one end to the other. I want there to be a shift in color and in value, keeping it darker, closer to the viewer, lighter as it pulls away. It creates more of a three-dimensional sense. The purple picks up on the purple that's in the sky and adds some variety to an otherwise just gray area. Once I'm done painting this layer on the road, I'm going to let this dry and come back to these two. I start off by painting water in alternating rows of lavender. If I painted this whole area with water, my purple would just run across the whole bottom of this painting and would look like one big purpley sky or lake. But I want to create this sense of rose. So by painting water in every other row, I'm starting to create divisions in the sections. I paint a first light layer of imperial purple and then come in with a darker layer of Rose of Ultramarine. With that layer of Rose of Ultramarine, I paint it in while the first layer of Imperial Purple is still wet, but because it's thicker, it doesn't flood everywhere. It tends to stay put where I lay it down, and the edges just diffuse softly with the Imperial Purple around it. I don't want to cover the entire area with the Rose of Ultramarine. I want some of the lighter purple to show up through it. Again, letting things fade as they recede into the distance helps add to the illusion of three-dimensionality. For the other rows, I go straight in and paint purple onto dry paper. This will make these areas darker and not as diffused as the other rows. I continue painting with Rose of Ultramarine. Where I want to soften things, I just use a brush that's barely damp and lift paint out. You can see from the paint on my palette that it's pretty thick and I'm getting these nice dark values but that also means I'm sacrificing granulation. I paint in those dark strips and then with a damp brush I just put ever so slightly a bit of water next to them. This creates variety in both the value and the amount of granulation I'm creating. 
Now I'm mixing French ultramarine, which is a slightly granulating color, in with the imperial purple. And I'm getting some really dark blues. My lavender fields are damp, but this bluish mix is pretty thick, so it won't go anywhere even though I'm painting right into damp paint. It stays put and just diffuses at the edges. This helps create the sense of different rows of lavender. Now I add French ultramarine and rose of ultramarine together at a fairly thick consistency. And I add some dark stripes right down the middle of my lavender fields. This is starting to create more depth and interest in those areas. Notice that I stopped short of going all the way to the end with a lot of these darks. An optical illusion that landscape artists use is the idea that as the land recedes into space, it has less contrast and less detail than it does when it's closer to us. By imitating that rule of illusion in our painting, we can create that depth. I need to let those fields of lavender dry, so I turn my painting around As I assess the mountain scene, I decide to come back in and make darker trees in front of the light ones. Those light ones have faded quite a bit in color, and they will look nicely as background misty trees. I use sap green and a little bit of indigo to create this dark mix. I paint right over those softer trees I painted earlier so that this will create the illusion of many layers of tree. When I'm creating these shapes of tree, I want to be sure I don't just paint green triangles. I'm painting the branches, but letting there be a lot of specks of the lighter paper showing through. And in a way, the faster you paint these shapes, the more organic and natural they will look. I want all those branches to be different lengths. I don't want to do this mechanically, so doing it pretty quickly creates shapes of trees and branches that are much more organic and have a lot of variety. I water down some of my mix and start painting in lighter shapes in between the darker shapes. Because of atmospheric perspective, things appear to be getting lighter the farther they are in the distance. And just by having some really light trees, some middle trees, and dark colored trees, we create the sense of a packed forest receding into space. These trees are done with more or less the same puddle of paint. Occasionally I'll dip maybe into the green or the purple, but for the most part, it's more about playing with your water to paint ratio. Be sure also to alternate the heights of the tree and the distance between the trees.
As I paint these trees in, some are painted on top of dry areas and some are touching up against damp areas. This helps with the sense of trees coming into view and trees that are being lost because of the mist or the fog. You'll see me as I lay down a tree if it's completely dry and you can see all the way around it. I might actually touch a couple of the edges with a damp brush just to have them bleed softly into the background. This paint is fairly thick, so it'll lay down dark. I'm adding just a few shapes of dark here and there that don't even have to be the actual shape of a tree. It can just imply denser branches in some areas or overlap between trees and other areas. If you're not sure about these tree shapes, you should practice in a sketchbook or on a scrap piece of paper first. Once I've painted in the shape, I'll even drop in a little extra different color. So if I do a shape with a light purple, before it dries, I might drop in a touch of green. This helps blend it in and make it more interesting. As you work on your trees, just be really sure to vary both the color and the value. Notice here I'm painting just a few dark areas in trees. Not the entire tree has to be the same value. Where there are darker tips, for example, it looks like the body of the tree is covered by mist and the tip is starting to stick out. With this layer of trees done, it's time to let this painting dry. So I go back to the road trip painting. Now I want to add in the landscape on the two sides of the road. My base color will be yellow ochre, which is a slightly granulating color. It's at a milk consistency, maybe slightly thicker, and I'm painting on dry paper. My brush marks all go towards that vanishing point, further adding to that illusion of everything merging at that vanishing point on the horizon line. I add just a touch of Hematite Genuine, which is a heavy granulator, but it's mixed in with the yellow ochre, which subdues it just a little bit. For the darker marks in the landscape, I use sepia. 
this is also at a fairly thick consistency and I'm dropping it in on slightly damp paper. I want to give that paint time to diffuse softly and I don't want to overstroke it. So I bump over to the landscape on the other side of the road. I use the same technique on this side. You don't have to use only granulating paints on these landscapes. Feel free to mix your granulators with non-granulators. Explore what they do. If when you brush in your darker marks, you find that the previous layer has totally dried and your dark marks are therefore not softly diffusing into it, that's okay. Just rinse out your brush, tap out the excess water on your towel, and run it along the edges of the darker marks you've put in. That should soften up their edges enough to give the impression of blending in with the rest of the landscape. I decide to paint a light bit of sap green along the edge of the landscape where it touches up against the road. You can see how shiny my painting is on the left hand side. That shows you just how wet it still is. I mix sap green into a bit of leftover indigo. And I build it up to a fairly thick consistency, slightly thicker than milk. And I start painting in just the suggestion of bushes and trees off in the distance. With these brush marks, just be sure that you have a lot of variety that the trees have different heights and different widths between them. The paint is pretty thick, so even though I'm painting along the horizon line, if it touches an area of the landscape that's pretty damp, it'll just diffuse a little bit. It won't flood the area. I paint a light line of green across the road and then softly diffuse it with just the tip of a damp brush. I soften it up to make it look like there's something interesting going on down there, but I don't have to define what it is. And then I run that soft brush along the edge of the sap green and landscape and road where all of those meet. I darken the road one more time, again with a very watery version of my black. I'm using lunar black, but if you don't have lunar black, there are plenty of other dark grays and blacks that granulate. I'm going to add just the last few brush strokes on the road, and then I will set this aside to dry. I'm done with this and it has a little bit of granulating paint in all areas.
The granulation really adds a nice texture to the road, the landscape, and the sky. So time to add in the last layer of details on the lavender fields. Just like I did on the road trip painting, I'm going to add a line of green trees at the end of the lavender fields on the horizon line. In the original photograph, there was a tree on the horizon line. But to show the distance I'm showing here, I would have to make that tree pretty small, and I think it would be fairly unremarkable. So instead, I choose to do a line of green trees all along the horizon. I start off with green gold, which is not a granulating color, but it will be the backdrop of the darker greens I will add in on top. When I add those darker greens, I will be sure to leave little peaks of this green gold poking through, adding dimension and light to the trees. I pick up sap green at a fairly thick consistency, almost a creamy consistency, and I apply it on top of the green gold. Not everywhere. I'm letting my brush sort of skip along and make different sizes and shapes of supposed bushes and trees along that horizon. Where the green meets the lavender fields, I do a straight line, further defining where the fields end and the distant landscape begins. Some of the green gold is still damp and it's blending in with the sap green, which really looks lovely. In other areas, the green gold has started to dry and it'll have more of a hard edge where I paint little holes around it. I want to be sure not to cover up that whole green gold area or make this line of trees all one homogeneous shape of sap green. With a thirsty brush, I come in and I pick up some of that damp sap green. The green gold shows through where I've done this, and it creates a bit more dimension in that line of greenery. So my line of trees has the lighter values and middle values, and now I want to add just a few dark shapes back there. I add French ultramarine to my mix of green and just touch in to a few areas very organically, almost as if I'm wielding around a calligraphy brush and just touching the brush to the paper randomly. I darken up just in a few areas where the green meets the lavender. With that same dark mixture of French ultramarine and green and imperial violet, I come in and put just a few dark marks in the creases right between the rows of lavender.
I'm sure not to use just a straight, even brush stroke for this, but rather my brush is sort of waving around. I give the tops of the flowers a bit of this darker color as well. I think I'm done with it. But as I take another look, I find that the white bits of paper that I left at the very end of the lavender fields are too white. So I touch a little bit of green gold into those areas. Although I do want to keep the back part of the fields lighter than the front, I find that the white paper is just too high contrast. By painting on a very watery bit of green gold, I find that it has toned that down just a bit. While the green gold is still wet, I touch it with watery sap green. This ties the fields into the trees and bridges that strong contrast I had before. And the lavender fields are done. I turn my attention to the misty mountains. And although I like what's going on, I find that the sky is just too blue. I want this to be a little more atmospheric. So I choose to paint a unifying glaze over a large part of the painting. Since I'm painting a larger area, I just reached for my larger brush. I've watered down that puddle of imperial purple that has also some indigo in it. And it's very watery, a weak tea consistency. I paint it over the sky and over the trees. I leave a little bit of white paper poking out of the right hand corner. And I like the way that this has toned down that sky that was starting to look more summery than I wanted. I continue to add this paint in other areas of the painting, unifying all the different parts. This watery puddle that I'm using to unify and glaze over the entire painting has quite a few granulators in it. The imperial purple has a touch of French ultramarine. And because it's quite wet, the granulation is really showing up adding to the misty atmosphere. So in this first lesson, we've looked at swatches of granulating colors and created three landscapes featuring different granulators. I hope you've enjoyed this exploration. I'll see you in our next lesson. Thanks for joining me.